like I said, we've seen David sin. He committed several sins. And he was in his 20s. Now he's in his 50s. I believe he should be a much more mature Christian now. Christian man. You know, when you're a young Christian, some of the sins we commit are sins that we don't, were sins we were not aware of. And the Lord doesn't hold us accountable for those. But once he, once he shows us their sin, then we need to grow. That's why you get off of milk. The Lord says you get off of milk and you start eating meat. It's because you're growing in your Christian walk. You don't stay a baby. You become a mature Christian. Now, apparently, it took David a little while to become a mature Christian. Even though everybody looks at him as a man of God, and he was. But it took him a while to get there. I pray that it doesn't take us that long to get there. That these Bible studies, these, these lessons on David will help us to where we don't make the same mistakes he made. At the beginning of 2 Samuel, he was doing good, becoming king, winning all his battles. He was doing real good. David, as we see, repented of many of his sins that he committed. Like, like we saw, he was up and down. He was down, he'd repent. His life was a roller coaster. But now he's, he's, uh, he's at the bottom. When I... I don't how can I say this rock bottom I mean he's murdered he's committed adultery I mean he is I don't even think wicked people get that wicked I mean you got wicked people at least don't kill anybody but David has killed a man he's a murderer and he's we're gonna find that he's getting back with the Lord but David had a weakness and he has a wicked a weakness that a lot of men have and that's women he has a weakness, and that's what it is. We're going to see to we're going to see that sins can be forgiven, and it doesn't have a long lasting effect. Some sins, but some sins like this, we pay for, and we're gonna we're gonna see here that these sins David has committed, he's gonna pay for them the rest of his life. We're gonna learn that up ahead, and now there's of sins that just affect you. We have, like, I'm not going to pick up sin out, but there are sins. We commit a sin, and it only affects us. But there are sins that we can do, and it affects other people. And David definitely was doing that here. And there's other ways that, that, that it can be done also, where our sins affect other people. The Lord has patience with us. But when we keep on sinning the same sin, the Lord finally has to chastise us. He forgives us, He forgives us, He forgives us, but when we keep asking for the same forgiveness, it's like, okay, you've been asking for forgiveness, I give them to you, but why do you keep doing the same thing over and over? So sooner or later, the Lord has to chastise us. David could have been stoned to death for committing adultery. That's what the Bible says. Or he could have been killed by Uriah. Uriah could have made it through that battle that David sent him in, come back, find out his wife is pregnant, surely it's going to get back to him, it was David's. So it could have happened that way, but it didn't. Because David was getting up in age, he was still a mighty warrior. But Uriah was a lot younger. He could have taken David, but like I said, that didn't happen. There's things that we look at like I just did. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You know, I would think something like this would happen, but God had something else for David. And we're going to start in 2 Sam Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. David is not the one who went to the Father to ask for forgiveness, but the Lord came to him. Right here it says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now David at this time has not repented yet. The Lord came to David to show him his sin. A lot of times we know our sin and we ask for forgiveness. Okay, but then some of us are, we are so far away from the Lord, we don't want to recognize it. So the Lord's like, okay, I'm going to send a man of God to tell you what you're doing, to show you what you're doing. In verse 2, 
The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herbs, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. And he did, of, and he did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and laid his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared, and he spared to take his own flock and his own herd, to dress for the wafering man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Like I said, David was blind to the things he was doing. But Nathan right here was sent by God to show him. And David is not recognizing that Nathan is talking about him. And he's saying, this man surely ought to die. It's been this way since the beginning of Adam and Eve. Eve blamed the devil for her sin. Adam blamed Eve for his sin. So since the beginning of the time, we always Lord, like to blame it on something else besides us. If it makes us feel better or what. But it's always, it's always been that way. We're always blaming somebody for what we did. And as I said before, a hundred times before, we sure can't say, well, the devil made me do it. We know that the devil can't make us do anything. If we, let, if we allow the devil to tempt us and we fall to it, it's because we have allowed him to do it. We have allowed him to bring the temptation and we have just freely fell into it. But we're always looking to put the blame somewhere else, just like here. We don't want to stand up to our sins. <clears throat> let me say this, until we see that we're just like David, and we are, this is just a Bible story. It's just going to be a story. But we're, we're like David. We might have killed somebody physically, but have you told somebody with words something that you shouldn't have said? Because words from a, from, from a person to another person a lot of times can hurt. Can hurt quite a bit. And that's a way of, of killing someone. So think about it. You know, okay, David, man. David done this, he done that. But have we done the same thing? Men? Lust, oh, we didn't commit adultery, but we did with our eyes. Because we learned last week, we're supposed to have a covenant with our eyes and tell our eyes, don't look. So, us men, lust, women, you do the same thing. Not as much as men. Men are known for that. We as Christians need to stay away from it. But women, you're the same way. So, David committed adultery. We commit adultery with our eyes, the Lord says. The Lord says if you just look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. So we're looking at David, I'm pointing at David, but really we need to point at ourselves. That's how bad I'm looking at David, but then I'm like, well, you know what? I've done just about the same thing. So that's why I'm saying, until we see us in David, this is just a story, a Bible story. But if you put yourself in David's place, you'll find it's almost the same. And it's a sin like lust. Sin is not, it's, lust is a sin people can't see. A man can look at a woman and have his thoughts going wild. Women can't see that. You know, people can't see that. But then there's sin that people can see. This sin is just on the man. And sin, well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But we're going to learn more about sin with David. In verse 5, it shows us what can happen when we respond in anger. Because that's what David did. He said, oh, this guy should surely die. So David responded in anger about this story that Nathan just told him. David was so mad at the man, he wanted to kill him. Wanted to have him killed. This is why we should always keep our eyes on the Lord. So we can realize that we're about the same as David. David didn't keep his eyes on the, line, on the Lord, but we, it's so important that we walk with the Lord. It's so important that we wake up in the morning 
with the Lord. That's very important. We wake up with the Lord. Because if we wake up and just go on about our day without the Lord, it's not going to be good. Because the Lord says to meditate on them day and night from the time you wake up until you go to bed. Meditate on them. Because if you're meditating on them, then you're, you're walking with them. This also shows when we get angry, we say things that we're going to regret later. Because he's going to regret saying this because he's going to see, hey, he was that man. But in real life, when we tell people stuff and later on it comes back to haunt us, we regret saying it. Especially when we find out if it really hurts somebody. Because as Christians, we don't want to hurt anybody. You know, the Lord is love. We're supposed to be love. David must have calmed down a little because in verse 6, he says, he said the right judgment in the matter. Nathan loved David very much and what he was about to do wasn't easy for him. He's putting his life on the line, in fact, to tell the king. David's the king. He's been on his, his life on the line telling the king. Even though he, he loved David and was close to David, he's still the king. That he was the one in the story. Telling David, you're the one in the story. In verse 7, it says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Nathan tells David, You are the man. Then he tells David, The Lord has anointed you to be king over Israel, and he is the one who has saved you from Saul. Telling him he didn't do all this on his own. David didn't do all this. All becoming king. God anointed him to be king. Saul, God saved him from Saul. And Nathan here is just reminding him. It's just like the Lord has to tell us. Remember, I, the Lord God, have given you all these things. Everything you have. Everything you have is from God. If we start taking credit and start saying, look what I have. The Lord can take it away just as quick as He gave it to you. He can take it away. But we do that. We do that. We're thinking we're the ones why we have this or that. It's because of us. We need to give God all the glory in everything. In everything we have and everything we do, we give God the glory. In verse 8, And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such thing. Again, who gave David all this? The Lord's just telling him again, Look, I gave you all, I gave you to be king over Israel. I gave you king to be over Judah. I've done I've done all this for you. Because it says the Lord gave him his master's wives. Now that doesn't mean we can have more than one wife. Okay? He had already had them. This is one of his sins, one of his new weaknesses, women. He already had it. It wasn't that God okayed him to have two wives. And we know that. If you read the scriptures, we know that. I'm not going to get on it, but I just don't want nobody to think, Oh, look, God gave him two wives. No, David gave himself two wives. Yeah. The last part of the verse, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such a things. If it wasn't enough, there would always have other things I would have done for you. So he's telling David, if that wasn't enough, I could have gave you more. This is what happens when you're walking with the Lord. Amen. When you're walking with the Lord, and all we have to do is go to Him and say, Father, because He gives us our needs. Without a doubt, He gives us our needs. But He gives us our wants too. Not all the time, but a lot of times He does. He gives us our wants. As long as He knows it's not going to hurt us, or it's not going to take us away from Him. Okay, Lord, I want a boat. Okay, I'm going to let you have a boat. But now you're out fishing every Sunday. Or when you get off of work, no time for the Lord. Stuff like that, he's like, mm, no, you don't need a boat. Because he already knows it's going to take you away from him. So when we ask for our wants, sometimes he gives us our wants. But sometimes if he doesn't, he knows why. Now verse 9, now listen to me. If you've heard any of these teachings, any of the teachings I've done here, verse 9, listen to it. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? This is what he's telling David. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife 
and had slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Do we know how strong that word is, despised? This is the word God is using, despised. It means to hate. So what he's saying here, why do you hate my commandments? This is what the Lord is saying. Why do you hate my commandments? When the Lord shows us scriptures on whatever, whatever it may be, when he shows it to us and we don't obey it, well, this is what we're doing. We're despi despising that command because if you're not doing it, it's because you don't want to do it. And if you don't want to do it, it's because you don't like it. And the, and the, the Lord says right here, why do you despise my commandments? That's pretty strong. Why do you hate my commandments? Right. And not only that, he says, why are you doing it in front of me? Because God sees everything, right? Mm -hmm. So he's saying, David, why do you hate my commandments? Why? And not only that, why are you doing it in front of me, in my sight? This, this verse right here is, is a verse we need to repeat to ourselves and, think, and meditate on it. Is there commandments out there that you are avoiding? You know they're there, but you're avoiding them. You're not obeying them. This is what it means right here. When you don't obey the commandments of the Lord, it's because you hate that commandment. And if you continue doing it, he's saying, why are you doing it? And you know I'm watching. I'll tell you what, a lot of times when I sin, I'm like, I know the Lord's looking at me right now. And a lot of times that turns me away from whatever it was, whatever the sin would have been. Knowing that God sees everything we do, everything. If you think you're by yourself and you can get away with this, think again. God is with us 24-7. So if you're hiding it from people, so what? They can't do nothing to you. But if you can't hide it from the Lord, that's when we ought to do something. Hope you understand this verse right here. Why do you hate my commandments? Why? Let me put it this way. Either you love or you hate. With the Lord there's no like. Like he says, you can't ride the fence. You either for him or you're against him. So you either love his commandments or you hate his commandments. Do y'all hear me? That's the bottom line. John 14, 15. It says... If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. Did he say, if you love me, keep some of my commandments? That's not what he said. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That means keep all his commandments that, we've, that he's shown us to do. If you love me, he said, if you love me. If you don't love me, then you don't have to follow my commandments. You don't have to do my commandments. But if you love me, Keep my commandments. So that's how we show God we love Him. We keep His commandments. Amen? Amen. If you want to show God you love Him, keep His commandments. It's like women pastors. Women pastors. They hate God. I say that because they don't, they don't obey the, the uh, commands of God. The Lord plainly says, This is who uh, is qualified to be a pastor or a preacher. And he addresses men. He's without a doubt he's addressing men. But you got women out there who are preaching, being pastors. They hate the word of God. The bottom line. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it or anything, or maybe they just didn't understand. No. They understood it and they're ignoring it. Right. And if they're ignoring that, how can you be under this woman pastor when she's ignoring and disobeying the the commandments of God? So women preachers, who, if anybody's out there who has a woman preacher as their pastor, uh, I'd leave. I'd leave. Because women teach women. That's what women do. That's what the Lord says. Women teach women. And I could go into all kind of detail with that, but I'm not, I'm not going to. You know, husbands, it's a command from God that we love our wives as, as Christ loved the church. You know how Christ loved the church? How many times do we fail the Lord in, your, in our own life? Because we're the church. In our own life, how many times do we fail the Lord? And He keeps forgiving us. Hmm? Husbands, do we do that with our wives? Now, some, some, some husbands I can say yes. But I know a lot of husbands that uh, no. They don't love their wife that way. Any little thing and they're ready to jump all over her. Any little thing, they're like, they don't want to forgive. They don't. They hold grudges. 
God doesn't. That's not the way God loves us. So, men, are we loving our wives as Christ loved the church? Think about it. Meditate on that. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So, wives, are you obeying? Are you obeying? God is saying, women, you submit to your husband as you submit to me. Just like you submit to me, you submit to your husband. So if you're not submitting to your husband, you're not submitting to the Lord either. Because he made this a command for y'all. So if y'all disobeying that, do y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. The Catholics didn't like the Ten Commandments. So what they do? They changed it. They took the one that said, don't bow down the statues, not the worship idols. They took that out. And they took the Tenth Commandment, broke it up in two, so they could still have Ten Commandments. So not just people, but religions do it. Yeah. But we don't like that. We hate that. We hate that commandment from God. That's exactly what they're doing. This verse, I'm telling you, we need to really think about what we're doing and how we're living. Are we living to please the Lord? You know, I've committed sins. But I sure didn't change the Ten Commandments so I could do one of them. The Word of God is the Word of God. These are commandments. He's not asking. He's saying, this is a command. This is what I want you to do. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Now, either we love them or we hate them. Like I said, there isn't, He doesn't take like. You either love the Lord or you hate the Lord. He says, either you're with me or you're against me. That's what he says. So, if we're having trouble here, we need to repent. Get on our knees, repent, and ask the Lord's forgiveness. And the great thing about it, if it comes from your heart, God says you're forgiven. Amen? Amen. We have a good God. A good God. He says to do evil in His sight. If it doesn't bother you when you're sinning, and you know the Lord sees it. If it doesn't, if that doesn't bother you, I would have to question myself. Do I love the Lord? To do evil in His sight? That's pretty hard to say. I love the Lord, but you're out here sinning. Right in front of Him. Now, this is one that many preachers and teachers use. When they don't want to obey a verse in the Bible, they'll say, well, that was uh, for back then. What did our God say? He's the same today tomorrow no same yesterday today and tomorrow he said I'm the same but we have preachers we'll have preachers that say oh that was just for that dispensation that was just for that time we again like I said we use excuses when we don't want to obey the words of God now the religions do this preachers do that oh, that was just for back then the Old Testament is all about Jesus the New Testament is all about Jesus. The Bible is Old and New Testament together. There is no, that was just for back then. The Lord says in Malachi, I am the Lord thy God. I change not. So what he says. Verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house. He's telling David. Because thou hast despised me and hath taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Again, there's that word despise. David wasn't walking with the Lord. So the Lord said, why, why did you hate me? Because it was a sword that had Uriah killed. God is saying, now you're going to live by the sword. Because of what you did, now you're going to have to live by the sword. It says it plainly here. When we clearly sin, a sin that we know, and continue in it, we're showing God. We're showing God that we hate Him. These are for two verses. If y'all have heard anything on the teachings of David, please listen to these two verses. Sin is, is terrible. Sin is awful, terrible, and it will destroy you. It will destroy us. That's why we need to obey the words of God. Most of, most of us didn't realize a lot of times we were committing sin. But like I said, when the Lord shows it to you, now it's your choice. Do I continue or do I repent of it? Believe it or not, I do have a praise God here. And that's if, if you realize it, when the, short, when the Lord shows you and you realize it and you ask for forgiveness, 
like I said a while ago, praise God. He forgives us. Amen. He doesn't want to hold it against us. If you come to Him with a true heart and say, Lord, please forgive me. Ah, God is... He says, not only am I going to forgive you, I'm going to forget about it. Amen. Amen. That's our God. That's who loves us. That's who loves us. Like I said, God is love. He wants to forgive us. Right. But we need to want Him to forgive us. We need to really hate sin. And go to Him and say, Lord, please forgive me. And like I said, and if it's coming from the heart, Amen. He forgives. Amen. Verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up an evil against thee out of thy own house, and I will take thy wives before thy eyes, and give them unto thy neighbors, and he, sh and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of, of this son. Because of, his, because of his sins, God says, there will be bad trouble in your house. Because of the sins you've committed. Like I said, when we sin, be ready. Like I said last week, be ready. Because we're going to have to pay the consequences of our sins. We will. We're forgiven. But just like a man, if he kills somebody, and he goes to jail, prison, and he finds the Lord, truly finds the Lord, and truly gets born again, well, the Lord's going to forgive him for killing that man. But he still has to pay the cost. Right. So remember that. Remember that. Sin sometimes... There's a heavy price to pay for it. Especially when the Lord chastises you for it. And then he says, and your wives, your wives are going to go in front of two other men before your eyes. Verse 12, for thou doest it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. What he's saying, everything you did, you did in secret. But what I'm going to have done to you, he says, before the Son, which what, what it means in English, he says, in broad daylight, I'm going to let this happen to you. Verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. And the reason he told him that was because of what I said ago. A while ago, adultery. You were stoned to death for adultery. In Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10. It says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So adultery, the penalty for adultery was death. Yeah. And that's why Nathan told David, You're not going to die, even though you should, but you're not. It also says in Leviticus 24, 17, it says, And he that killeth any man, which that's what David did, it says, He that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. So twice David committed sins, two sins that he should have died for. You might ask, is God a respecter of persons? You know, why did he let David get away with it? He's not getting away with it. It might look like he's getting away with it. In fact, if he does die, where's David going? David's a man of God. So adultery and, and, and killing somebody doesn't send you to hell. Only rejecting Jesus sends you to hell. That's the only sin that sends you to hell. These other sins that we have, none of those sins send, sends us to hell. Adultery, murder, lying, whatever. None of that sends you to hell. Only rejecting Jesus in your heart sends you to hell. So, if he would have died, if he would, if they, if they would have stolen him, he would have went to go be with the Lord. And the Lord says, "No, no, I'm gonna make you pay for it. This is you'd get off too easy if I'd go ahead and bring you home. You hear me? So David is not getting away with his sin. He's not. David is awakened to the fact that he's been unfaithful to the Lord. This is where we can be like David. He has confessed on the way he's been living." David finally repents and confesses on the way he's been living. We're going to see that David is going to pay greatly for his sins, though. Even though he's repented, he's confessed, he's still got to pay for his sins. Verse 14, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. This blaspheming is going on today. 
men say, men say, and believe it or not, men say, well, look what David did. And that's the man of God. So if he did it, and the Lord forgave him, then why can't I do it? The Lord's going to forgive me. Now, does that sound like that's coming from your heart? Now, that sounds like someone who's, again, trying to get away with sin, to have an excuse to sin. Well, look at David. These men cannot compare themselves to David. I know we don't see it, but when God said David was a man after God's own heart, he was. I'm showing a lot of the ups and downs of David, but if you read all of David, his heart was after God. Especially at that young age when he, when he fought Goliath, he had all his faith in God. I mean, he was a man of God. But as we can see, he had a lot of weaknesses. And so don't ever, we, don't ever think we're there. That we can't be knocked down. Because we can. That's why I say we need to wake up with the Lord. Wake up with the Lord and go to bed with the Lord. Meditate on, meditate on Him day and night. That's not, the Lord said, hey, the best way to fight temptation, the best way to fight the devil, is to get closer to me, He said. Get closer to me. That's the best way you can fight the devil. So that's why I'm saying, wake up with the Lord. Get close to the Lord. As soon as you wake up, get close to Him. Prayer, reading, whatever it, whatever it is, get close to the Lord. Because He says, if you get close to me, that's the way you fight temptation. Is by getting closer to me. Amen? Amen? Now, if God was to give us a choice, like He's right, right here, He said, He told David, you're not going to die, but He said, but your son's going to die. Now, if God was to give us a choice, a man, and say, hey, because of your sin, I can take your life or I'll take your son's life. Probably most of us would say, no, Lord, take my life. But God didn't give David a choice. That's what I'm saying. David did not get away with this. God took his son home. That's a high price to pay. Like I said, if, if they would have stoned David to death, he'd be in heaven. So how much, have, how much did he have to pay for? Now, he probably lost rewards in heaven. Because the, the way you walk down here, the closer you walk with the Lord, the more rewards you'll have in heaven. But like here, David messed up quite a bit. He's lost a lot of rewards. But I'm sure if God would have given him a choice, he would have said, no, take my life. David was a man of God, a king of the people. Everyone knew of his sins. And because of that, God put on David a much greater punishment than death. Like I said, he took his son. Plus the rest of his life was going to be hard. He'd be living in, and he's going to live in a lot of tribulation. Wars, battles. A man or a woman who wants to be like, like David. David was a man after God. If we want to be like David, not on these sins, but when David walked with the Lord, he walked with the Lord. Now, if we want to be like that, we want to, if we want people to say, hey, Jesse, that's a man after God's own heart. Well, for them to say that, I got to live by the commandments of God. For them to see that. And walking with the Lord, a man after God's own heart, or a woman, when I say man, that's everybody. The Beatitudes definitely is the way to walk with God. You do the, the Beatitudes, then you're a person after God's own heart. And I'm just going to run to them real fast to show you what walking with the Lord is. This is what walking with the Lord is. This is what being God after God's own heart is. The Beatitudes, poor in spirit. Knowing there's nothing, there's nothing of us. It's all of the Lord. We know we're nothing without the Lord. That's being poor in spirit. They that mourn, it says. What that means, they hate when they sin. Which I've already shown that. But that's what that means. To mourn. Not to mourn over somebody who died. It's right here, it's talking about spiritual life. It's to mourn when you sin. You should hate sin so much that when you do commit it, you should mourn. It should de de devastate you. The meek is people who are humble. They're humble. Even when they're right and someone has, has made them look like they were wrong, but they're meek. They don't do nothing about it. They just take it. 
They don't argue. They don't fight. They'll just take it. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who love the Lord love His words. Love His words. If you're hungry, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, that's the way you show the Lord you love Him. Because you're hungry for His words. You're hungry to know how He wants us to live. The merciful, they don't look to get even. That guy that threw coffee on me and kicked me in my hiney when I was working, believe me, I had mercy on that guy. The Lord has made me merciful not to react when stuff like, ha like that happened. The pure in heart, they seek God in everything they do. The pure in heart. The peacemaker, they tell people about the Lord. They're always witnessing and talking about their father. Witnessing. They which who prosecute for righteousness sake. They don't care if they're rejected for living for the Lord. That's the way we're prosecuted. People don't accept us. But that's okay with us. When men shall revile you. When you don't react when men say evil or falsely things about you. Now this is what's walking with the Lord. This is the Beatitudes. I had a long teaching on this. I went in great detail on each one of these. But this is what is walking with the Lord. Being this kind of person. So if you want to walk with the Lord. If you really want to say, Lord, I want to, I want to know how to walk with you. Read the Beatitudes. That would definitely make you a person who's walking after God's own heart. If you live by them. Now verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Let us notice that God is still calling Bathsheba Uriah's wife. He's still calling her Uriah's wife. And this it, it says, and it was very sick, is a boy. He's a boy. And it don't say it here, but in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 27, it's a boy. Now verse 16, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and laid all night upon the earth. David knew that this was his fault. This is not a good place to be. This is not a good place to be. When you see that your sin has affected someone else, especially, especially your child or anyone that you might love, this is not a good place to be. David is begging the Lord to heal his son. He's begging him. David is now showing how much he hated committing the sins he did. He has definitely repented. He is regretting so much of the way he, he was living. Because now he sees what it's going to cost him. Don't let that happen to us. The Lord has shown us here. This is not a Bible story. The Lord is teaching us. Hey, you want to commit that sin? Be ready to pay for it later. And it might cost you dearly. As for sin, no matter how big or how small it is, it still should affect us the same way. Because remember, in God's eyes, sin is sin. Verse 17, And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? Now he wouldn't get up off the ground. He would, I mean, while the baby was still alive, he was sick, but while the baby was still alive, like I said, he was begging God, please don't take him, please don't take him. You know, take me. I'm sure this is what he was saying. But, the, but his son did die. Now, after his son, after the Lord took his son, in verse 19, But when David saw that his servants whispered, they perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, Yes, he is dead. They were afraid to tell him that he was dead. You know, go to a king and say, Your, your child is dead. Your son is dead. To a king. Remember, this is a king. This, we know we have a president. President ain't nothing. Kings. Kings have power over everything. If, he, if a king says, put him to death, you're put to death. King don't have to go through anybody. Just like the president, he's got to go through, he's got to go through all kinds of stuff. No, a king, 
He just says it and it's done. So these guys were afraid to tell him, hey, your son is dead. And they didn't want to lie to him either and say, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Let me go look. Right. <laughs> In verse 20, now he was begging and he wouldn't eat or he wouldn't do anything. He wouldn't clean himself or anything because while the child was still alive because he was fasting, mourning, begging the Lord, please don't take him. Then in verse 20, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. He cleaned himself up and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when he required thy set bread before him and he did eat. The David just lost his son. His son. The Lord just took his son home. And what did David do? He came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Is that a man of God? <laughs> it's a man of God. Right. Now, I'm not saying I'm like David, but when the Lord took Tara home, I still, like I said, I still praise and worship the Lord. It rains on the just and the unjust. You know, God never told us everything would be nice and rosy for us once we become Christians. But I did. I was at her funeral, like I said, I, I praised God. Now, I'm not saying I'm like, like, like David, but this is what I did. So it can be done. You can lose somebody in your family. Now, there's a difference when you lose somebody in your family who's going to heaven... And you lose somebody in your family and you know they're not going to heaven. There's a big difference. I can rejoice that Tara, my daughter, and that my mama is in heaven. I can rejoice over that. I miss them. I mourn. But I can rejoice because they're in heaven. You know, you can't say that for everybody in your family. You get someone in your family and you know they weren't born again. Now that's not easy to take. Because we as Christians, we know there is a heaven and there is a hell. That's why we... If we witness to anybody, we should witness to our family. Because we don't want that day to come where they never came to know the Lord. Partly because you didn't say anything. You all hear me what I'm saying? Verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou doest raise and eat bread. And like I said, this is the way people who know the Lord respond. This is what we do. If you don't know the Lord, either you're going to go into a depression, or you're going to become an alcoholic, or you're going to become a drug addict, or you just might go ahead and take your life. That's the way people without the Lord take it. We as Christians, we praise God. And we get up and start doing, okay, Lord, help me through this day. And he does, because that's what he did with me. I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, you're going to have to totally carry me if you want me to keep going. And amen, he did. He did. I give all credit to God. I give, give, I give God all credit in everything. Why? Because I know Jesse. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will gracious, be gracious to me that the child may live? Now, David was hoping that the Lord would change his mind. Because Nathan told him the child will die. And David's praying to the Lord that he'll change his mind. And not take his son's life. And we need, we, we, the Lord God doesn't change. But, in, in certain situations, like with, uh, like with Abraham. Abraham told God, hey, if I can find so many righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, Will you spare them? And God said, yes, if you can find that many. But Abraham couldn't find that many. And you know, went on down, went on down, and ended up he couldn't find nobody. But God said, if you find this many in there, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So, so God can change his mind. Okay? And that's what David was doing. He was begging and pleading to God to change his mind, but he didn't. But don't get confused. Like I said, don't get confused because Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord thy God. I change not. We're talking about His words. The Bible. Now verse 23. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So this is, this is a verse right here that without a doubt, the Lord gave to me when Terah went to be home. 
this this is the verse that I hung on to like I don't know what. Because just like David, he said, David said, he can't come back to me, but I'm going to go be with him one day. Amen. That's why I say David was a Christian. So I know that one day I will see Tara again and I will see my mother again. And that's, that's the word of God. And just like everything else, I obey it. I, I trust it. I believe in it. I believe in it. I have to believe in it. I would be totally destroyed if I didn't believe in the Word of God. Right. And again, uh, he says, the child's not going to come back to me. So these people who say they've gone to heaven, they come back and they tell us what heaven was like. Baloney. That doesn't happen. They got a movie on it. I forgot the name of it, but a little boy went to heaven. He came back and told everybody what it was like and blah, blah, blah. That's a story. That's heathens who made that movie because it's not biblical. Once you make it to heaven, you don't come back. That's not God's words. When that does happen, when, when mediums or whatever, they sermon the dead. And if you do see somebody, a spirit is demonic. Is demonic. It's not from God. That's why mediums, Ouija board, all that stuff is wicked. And it's true. It, it, it can happen. But it's not from the Lord. It's either that way or, or they got cameras can do anything now. Cameras can make you see things that are not there. Yeah. You know, just so, but it's not true. Please don't ever think, well, I wanted to, if, if that was real. Just like that movie, I'm, a lot of believe a lot of people believe that movie. I can say that because at the gym they were talking about it, and I told them, I said that's full of baloney. It can't happen. <laughs> and they looked at me like I was crazy, but that's okay. People look at me like I'm crazy all the time, anyway. <laughs> but I told them that, and they were like, "You don't think that can happen?" I said, oh, "I know it can't happen. It's not the word of God. It's not in there. Yeah. Once you make it to heaven, you're in heaven. There is no coming back." Yeah, and plus, if you're a really born again Christian and you're with Jesus, you ain't gonna want to come back over here. And you wake up. <laughs> so, if you hear people who do that or, or, or talk about it, know this it's demonic. It's not from the Lord. People cannot come back from heaven. Mary is not out there, Jesus is not out there. People see Mary, people see Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know. That ain't happening. Next time we see Jesus, is going to come to take his church. It ain't going to be on Tostitos tortillas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Piece of butter bread toast. You know? <laughs> now, verse 24. And David confronted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her, onto her and laid with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Now, remember back in verse 15, it called Bathsheba Uriah's wife. But now David has repented. David's back with the Lord now. So now the Lord is saying, Your wife, Bathsheba, is your wife. David has paid his for his sins and he has repented of them and has been forgiven. So now they're no longer committing adultery. Now they're now she is his wife. This is for those who get a divorce without cause. It is a sin. If you get a divorce from your spouse and it wasn't because of adultery, then it's sin. Because God says that's the only reason, permission to get a divorce is if one of them were unfaithful. <clears throat> and a lot of people are like, they act like that's the unforgivable sin. It's not. Just remember all sin is forgivable. Yes, I, I got a divorce, but I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for what I did. And I truly meant it. Like I said, if you truly meant it, God forgives. But there's some people who, who, they make it the unpardonable sin. It's not. And I would say, don't look down at people who have divorced. It's just a sin, just like we sin. Now, after David got right with the Lord, after he got right with the Lord, now remember, David's still going to have to pay for his sin. But once he got right with the Lord, he blessed him with his son, Solomon. And in 1 Kings 5 7, it talks about that he was a, a wise man, which we all know Solomon, people know Solomon as having 
much wisdom. So he was blessed. So David got right with the Lord, back right with the Lord again, and he blessed him with a son who had a lot of wisdom and also was a man of God. Now, the teaching on David has been eight parts. There's a lot in there. A lot has been said. But take your notes. Take your notes because there's a lot. There's eight parts. Review what you've learned about David. Review it. Refreshing it in your mind. And think about it. Meditate on it. So we don't do like David. This is why the Lord showed up. A man of God. Well he did this. He did that. Well yeah. The Lord showed that. So we can learn from it. He wasn't showing it just to make David look bad. He was showing it so we can learn from his mistakes. This is what this teaching is on. That we can learn from David. And grow in our walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.